the suppression of the use of marijuana and of the forces lurking behind it are the most important jobs this department is now engaged in. In 1930, the records on marijuana in the Washington office of the Narcotics Division scarcely filled a small folder like this. Today, they fill cabinets. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, Coloradians, and everyone that's smart enough to listen from the outside. It's one of the most amazing plants we've ever discovered. The pot party, the trippers, the grasshoppers, the hip ones, all gathered in secrecy and flying high as a cup. Please! I got really fucked! Welcome back to Stone Deputy with your host, as always, it's me, Kip Wilson. And I'm trying to record this again with proper recording equipment. I'm sorry, Eve. But I'm joined today by committee member, um, friend of the program, friend in real life, and all-around knowledgeable foodie, Mr. Jeremy Harlan. Jeremy, how are we today, brother? Chip, we're doing good. Uh, Again. Yeah. So we tried to record this episode in your house. I thought I was doing everything swimmingly. But I managed to biff that up. So hopefully today it goes much more uh, smoothly on the back end. Because I thought the conversation flowed beautifully. And you spoke eloquently about the March Madness bracket, which is what we have you on to talk about. For those that don't know, Jeremy is a two-time member of the March Madness committee. He's probably the per. I don't think I know anyone that knows barbecue better than you, except for maybe Daniel Vaughn out of Texas Monthly Barbecue Magazine and former guest on the pod himself. But quite literally, I consider you a savant when it comes to unearthing dank eats, not only around Denver, but the world. It's a tough job. I mean, nobody does it better than you, Kip. But, you know, I uh, I like to pride myself knowing the suburbs a little bit, a little older than everybody else. So I live out here in the burbs, but there are some uh, some beautiful gems out here in the suburbs. You just need to Get off your Lime scooter, get in your car, and go find us. Personal attack. We don't have Lime scooters in the city or town of Arvada. So I'm, I appreciate you putting a little salt in the wound. But you're exactly right. Every member of our committee, um, we ask them to join us because they maybe either have a different expertise or they have a different writing style or any of those kind of things that tickle the fancy or maybe cover our blind spots when it comes to the culinary scene of Colorado. But that's what we wanted to talk a little bit more about. Um, Jeremy, you obviously two-time member, so you know kind of the lay of the land. And even if the the genres may change a little bit, maybe the restaurant scene itself changes, and it has. But nonetheless, we come back here every March, we sit down, and we knock out the most selective 64 that can go for the, the the belt. And it's going to be a doozy. Are you excited? What are we expecting out of this year's bracket? Yeah, I'm ready, I'm ready to dance. I think uh, we have a couple new entries that uh, are going to make some waves. We have some stalwarts that, you know, some previous champions that are in and are already immediately are showing their dominance in the first round. And we look at uh, speaking about Caroline Glover and Annette. They're already uh, making uh, making it known, making their presence known in the first round here. So uh, very excited. Denver has such a, a wide ranging scene that's always growing. Is it growing too fast? Maybe. You know, we may find out in a year or two if there's too many restaurants. But I think we all that live in the Denver metro area should be excited about all the options, the great options that we have, and all the great chefs that have come to our community to open up uh, concepts. Yeah, you know, I think you were one of the first ones that kind of said it. But we've seen a little bit of change of guard as to who may have the longest wait times to get in. And that may be because of folks like the Michelin Guide coming in. Obviously, the Beard Foundation's been here for a while. They crowned, as you know, aforementioned, Caroline Glover of Annette right after we crowned her the Stone Abatite March Madness uh, champion. So there's no coincidence there. We can honestly say that. We had zero to sit part in that. But at the same time, in the Denver scene, it seems like trends come, trends go. You know, whether it's battery of tacos or whether it's foie gras or the cauliflower of the month or charred cabbage. Like we see it, we're seeing different things. So like what maybe peaked two years ago or restaurants that maybe have been around and been staples, they are not one scenes this year. You know, you're, you're ever, you know, 
we're always grateful for places like Tavernetta, but they're right out the gate. They're a two seed because there's so many new and popular places kind of in that same realm. It's, it's going to be a knockdown drag out. We have a lot of fine dining, but I'm surprised that I wonder if the Michelin Guide has had a little bit of influence in how we've all kind of uh, dictated our dining out process. Yeah, and I think the popularity also comes with just that kind of human, uh, natural human thing to look at the, the brightest, the newest toy uh, that's just opened and maybe that's the hottest thing. We see that in the, in the bracket, like you said, like Tabernetta. Tabernetta has not gone down in quality by any means in the past couple of years. It's just that they've been around for a while. So people might go somewhere, look somewhere else and their attention somewhere else. Sapsu is for me is a perfect example of that is the hot new restaurant in town. And it's getting a lot of accolades very deservedly by all means. But you know, I mean, that's, that's going to be a restaurant in this bracket that is going to cause a lot of, uh, Disruption or, you know, they, they are going to beat people because they are the hot, shiny new cars, like we always like to say. They are grabbing everybody's attention right now, both locally and nationally. No, I think, you know, that's a big part. And obviously, we've seen that the national, we've seen a little bit of national influence. And it usually comes around the Edible 8 to Final Four region. Edible 8, obviously presented by our friends over at Dialed In. But that's when it gets hot and heavy. We're talking about nearly five grand in prizes for the winning restaurant between back house, front of house, and staff gifts. Like, it's worth it. And to utilize, it's a somewhat popularity contest because it's all run through social media. It plays to that advantage, whereas at the same time, it may hinder some of the diamonds in the rough that you obviously very well know, not only in the Burbs, but in the Denver area and being a native to the community for what 50 fucking years sorry to date you there I, I guess i didn't give you the proper intro before we did go deeper give me your three favorite styled foods and your three favorite re- uh, food city okay so for folks that don't know i work for cnn i've done a bunch of uh you know i've been with cnn for 20 years i've been around the world done a lot of food stories uh I am a, what I like to call a three-time loser in the James Beard Awards. I've been nominated three times, but I've lost all three times. But in that time, I've, I've done a lot of journalism and, and learning about the people that provide us food. So not so much food reviews or crit, you know, doing reviews of restaurants. I like to go and, and, and meet the people that are that are growing the food. The Stevie Love, for example, out uh, on the Western Slope growing peaches and apples and pears. Um, or the, the workers that pick our vegetables and whatnot. Those are where the real stories are, uh, real good food journalism. It's learning about the people that, um, that provide us uh, that food and those, those great moments that we have with our family and friends at restaurants. So in terms of my what I love to eat, um, like you mentioned before, I do love Texas-style barbecue. I think it is the best barbecue in the country, best style barbecue. Um, I am half Cajun, so I do not mind going down to Louisiana and trying some of the, you know, my favorites like boudin. I make a pretty good gumbo. Um, and I do like Italian food. So, for example, I would say that Rome is my number one favorite food city in the world. Uh, Barcelona is excellent. Um, surprisingly, Moscow has got a, a really crazy food scene. It's mostly Georgian food, right? And Ukrainian. Hey, but it's- I've heard they have <laughs> kick-ass groceries. Um, they, have, no, I would not say that. I think, uh, anybody that, first of all, my little tip for folks, anybody that goes to Russia or Moscow, which you should do, it isn't a, Moscow, the central part of Moscow is very vibrant, amazing. We've totally gone off on a tangent here, but do not order hard cheese in Russia because of the sanctions. Uh, they do not get hard cheese imported. So they have tried to make hard cheese and done so terribly wrong so they cannot get the consistency right so they have put in like cement additives and stuff to try and harden their cheeses in russia do not get hard cheese if you're in russia but otherwise besides that uh it is a very interesting food city it's vibrant i did not see that coming time out so first off if you're not you know a millionaire with a propaganda and like plan in place are you allowed to like try? Like, could I go to Moscow tomorrow uh, on like a just a, a travel visa? Sure, you could, but you're also an American, and knowing your like, pro- gr- and gr- recreational uh, uh, things, I would absolutely not go to Moscow right now. Huh. Yeah, mozzarella good, cheddar bad. 
Okay. All right. You learn something new every day. Well, now that we've kind of gotten a brief history, let's go ahead and get your hands and my hands dirty. We had six committee members helping us pick elected 68. It all comes down to me. So if you have a problem with them, as I've said before, shoot me a DM. I'll gladly explain to you why I chose one bakery over another or why I chose you know, whatever. But I took recommendation from six folks that know better than I do about different styles of food and places that maybe I don't clip as often. Jeremy being one of those folks, I I lean on him a lot for giving me tips on barbecue. But this motherfucker and I actually met through standing in lines at bakeries and at barbecue restaurants together. So he has the lay of the land for everything, but he also kind of knows a little bit more than he leads on. Let's dive into it. Who do you expect to kind of come out? Like, let's just say genres of food. You don't have to be specific. Who do you expect a big showing from this year? Are we looking at casuals? Are we looking at omakase? Is this the year of the Michelin diner? What are we expecting out of the bracket? Well, being the big meat lover, uh, I'm going to start with Easy Vegan. Um, oh, no, I did not, I did not <laughs> expect that. Uh, so I was about to nod. I was like, yeah, he's going to say AJ's or Pit Pete, but no, never mind. Chef Lexi Mandolini is one of the best chefs in Denver. You do not need to qualify her a best vegan chef. She is one of the best chefs. She just happens to do vegan food. And her partner, Taylor, is right there with her. Phenomenal. They run an outstanding business. We talk and they make amazing food. We talk about this being a popularity contest. They did not do well last year because they were in the middle of a blackout, social media blackout, while they were winning the great food truck race on the Food Network. They are ready this year. They will be here on their Instagram. They now have a much bigger following because of their victory on the great food truck race. They now can deploy their Instagram army uh, this year, and I think they have an opportunity to make great waves right they they can go far if if they can utilize their social media strength also people just need to go eat easy vegan if they have not before it is fantastic food i love what they do with fresh ingredients they don't try and do meat substitutes like calling it quote unquote chicken or quote unquote beef like they are just doing fantastic food vegan otherwise uh every Sunday at the markets, they do pop-ups, they do uh, collaboration meals, they do, they cater fundraisers. I mean, they are everywhere. They are killing it in this community. They are absolutely someone that should be watched out for in this bracket. I, I couldn't agree more, not only for one reason being, it's the same model we saw Chef Penelope Wong and Chef Not knockers is what our her nickname is they torched the competition last year as what one would consider a food truck they did pop-ups they did our cannabis dining series which probably helps tilt the vote a little bit because we're just so fucking awesome but realistically it's exactly that it's like down-to-earth chefs you don't have to have this like super flashy brick or mortar to resonate with folks and so when you say first off easy vegan it reminds me eerily similar of chef penelope last year utilizing that yan wan tan um you know social media profile and game because it is you know a popularity contest for doing this through social media um and yeah last year that sucks i feel so bad about that it was such a weird dynamic so they won their first matchup because they were allowed to do it, but they were filming the great food truck race. Yes, they are a pop up, but they were a pop up that commandeered a, a truck and then beat every other existing truck that was competing, which gives them even more kudos. But quite literally, when they were in the round of 32, they weren't allowed to be on their cell phones in real life. So while the show maybe didn't air until September, those two days, it was them trying to duke it out blindly in March. So it's that's a great call, but they're in a, a star-studded region. Is that your only dog you got in the race, or do you have a few more you feel that could uh could make a deep run? Maybe not make a deep run, but I'm just going to go ahead and get on my uh, my apple give me your, my give apple your here. I want I want people to go back and try Barbosa's barbecue. Alex has been around for a while. I mean, I even talked to other committee members. They're like, oh yeah, I didn't even think of him because you know I, I haven't been to him in a while. He is doing incredible barbecue. He was my number one pick in the on wheels 
open fire cooking, right? Which is exactly what he is. He, you know, he rolls up in his trailer and he serves great Texas barbecue. He has even told me in the past year, he's really tuned in his, his meat smoking and really is at the top of his game, whether it's beef ribs, which are, you know, the, you will always get me with a beef, a great beef rib, his brisket, his turkey, if you know, on Wednesdays, his smoked wings are incredible. Dude, those wings with the Alabama white sauce. I know Chris has got some weird perverse thing about mayonnaise. You know, he jerks off to all sorts of weird stuff. You are exactly right. His wing game is second to none. And I, you know I love me some king of wings. You know I love La Diabla. Sure. But and those, are, those are exactly what you're talking about. They're sleepers, ones you almost forget about. I don't know if it's kind of the shiny toy syndrome, as you mentioned earlier, or if it's that, you know, it, we can only get those chicken wings once a week, but holy fuck, those are delicious. What a great it, call. It is absolutely the new shiny car, like in front of our face there. Like he's been around for years, a few years. He's done great barbecue. He continues to do great barbecue. But I think people just kind of slowly forgot. Yeah, he didn't get a Michelin star this year. Or he may not be a James Borden winner. I promise you, he is serving up some of the absolute best Texas-style barbecue, craft barbecue in Denver. People need to get on Instagram and check out where he's at on the weekends. You need to That's go Banded practice. Oak right there off 6th Ave is where he used to be on a regular basis. He usually, yeah, I think he, he bit... He bips and bops a little bit too. Yeah, he moves around, so he might come to your neck of the woods. You need to try it. Um, oh, who else? I mean, uh, as a South Side, I love Los Tos Patrios. Are they going to win? No, they're not going to win. Why? Because they have zero social media presence. They're too busy. That's not true. Money. Fuck you. Okay, so I don't. I'm not a regular at LDP, as you call it in the birds. I don't think anyone calls it that, but I love a good abbreviation. They have so many followers, and it's probably thanks to that jerk off at OCM. But at the same time, they have a very strong following. And now this is their second time in the three years of being in the action. I think they're actually involved. They already shared the the, the bracket. Okay. Jeremy, they okay. could make some noise. You should be I mean, confident will... with your suburban boys. I will I will go to bat for Los Dos. Uh, they are amazing. Good luck finding the table on a Friday night with less than a two-hour wait at Los Dos. So you are right. They are extremely popular. And, folks, if you want to drive down to the outlet malls and, uh, you know, get a do a little uh, shopping in Castle Rock, their new location is absolutely stunning. They built it from the ground up. It is a beautiful location with a beautiful view. That is excellent dining. I love Los Dos Patrios. Who else do I think is going to make uh, some waves? King of Wings is all like you mentioned. They're they're so good. Their new golden location, fantastic. Dude, uh, did you love it? I'm so glad you loved it as much as of I course. like. I knew you would. You love any grilled meat on the bone. Like you really are <laughs> a champion of like properly cooked meats, and they do it exceptionally. Like when you said Barbosa's wings, and obviously the beef rib, and really everything. He has those southern sides dialed in too. Yeah, like we talk about the meats. He does them really well up there with Blazing Chicken Shack. Yeah, of course. And then, listen, I would not be remiss to mention my people in Parker. Uh, they're the number one seed. That's a reason they're the number one seed. They are the dominant best bakery in the Denver metro area. You will not convince me otherwise. There is no competition. Poulette is the best. They will make some noise this year. Yeah, I agree. I think last year um, we've started to see more of not only obviously the Beard Foundation's uh, notoriety has helped pump them up even more, but local media. We finally got everybody down there. You know, I think you and I actually met down there about two years ago for Apple Fritter Day. Um, or we were in line and you ordered just about everything. And I was like, fuck, who's this guy that's got great taste? Give me whatever his box is. You're not wrong. Like, they were resounding number one overall CP. Those sandwiches that they brought into the fold as well are very much fire. And I think we saw a lot of folks voting for them to be in the final four. So it sounds like the word is starting to get out with Poulette a little bit, which is a great thing to see because Denver, like you said, needs to get off their lime scooters and go to Aurora, go to Parker, go up to Jenny Foe in Broomfield or Westminster that has him in clip. Go to Wayne's in Superior. Like 
it's not just Rhino downtown. You know, the Highlands are bust. We have a lot of gyms, and it's it's not even it's the exact. I don't know what the issue is, but I think the city of Denver's kind of shot themselves in the foot getting well, these small restaurant tours to want to open up in their city themselves. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a big a big issue aside from the bracket in that. We've seen this in other cities, and, my, and I've seen it in talking to people like Portland, for example, a perfect example where restaurant owners and chefs are going to suburbs like Beaverton or Vancouver, Washington or other places because just downtown Portland is not a suitable place to have a restaurant. And that's very true in Denver. Look at – go down to the 16th Street Mall right now. What is enticing about being down there right now with the construction, right? The, the restaurants are struggling hardcore to stay open in the 16th Street Mall area. Larimer Square is practically a ghost town. I mean, kudos to Rioja for staying open in Larimer Square. I think chefs will now finally need to start realizing that Denver and the little acronym neighborhoods are not going to be the place to go if you want to get up quickly and be a successful restaurant. Yes, there are success stories in Rhino and Low High and things like that. But there are it's so oversaturated with restaurants. And now it is so hard to get permits and the cooperation from the city of Denver that, you know, like the suburbs are where it's going to be, where people are going to have to open up the restaurants. And then people looking for good food might have to venture out a little further. Look at, we had lunch the other day at Red Llama, uh, a great, nice Peruvian place <laughs> tucked between like a witch, witch and a Red Wings shoes store. <laughs> and, and we asked the chef, why did you pick this place? She's like, well, we wanted to go to Denver, but Denver didn't want us. It was too difficult for them to open their restaurant. And so chefs are going to have to start going out to Broomfield and Arvada and North Glen and Thornton and Centennial because the rents are cheaper. It's easier to get permits and licenses and inspections done. And guess what? Like out in Douglas County, there are established families with money to spend, and they are looking, they are craving for restaurants that are not chain restaurants. Parker, as you said before, is wrapped around the finger of Poulet, right? And Parker takes great pride in them. And it's just, it just it seems like a win win situation for these restaurants are going to have to be. So, guess what? You're going to go to Littleton and you're going to go to a Maki Sushi Co., right? And you're going to find out it's great on Mikase. They're in the bracket. Like, that's a great opportunity. You go out to Aurora. I mean, clearly Caroline knew what she was doing. She's got her Aurora locked down. There are there are great gems around this city um, that aren't in the city of County and Denver. And thankfully, they are represented in our bracket. Yeah, I feel like I did a disservice to my community in Arvada, or Arvada for those that lived here for long amounts of time. Stone Cellar Bistro, I feel, is one of those. And while this one may be a little bit of an outlier, but Mary Gold and Lions, because Boulder seems to kind of have that same situation of, is the juice worth the squeeze when it comes to fucking having to do this dance, the cost of the square footage, the permitting issues, the dealing with, you know, whatever, you know, other ancillary situations may be arising. And before I dive in, you know, I mentioned one omission in Stone Cellar Bistro at Arvada, but, you know, one thing we mentioned on Tuesday's podcast, and it's we'll briefly touch on real quick, and it's something that you just mentioned is kind of plaguing the city of Denver. But uh, merchants and business owners of South Broadway, which two or three of which are represented on this year bracket, are not necessarily these restaurants, but businesses along South Broadway are starting to, I don't know if the term is unionize or create an HOA of sorts but creating a business group that's going to hire private security so their windows aren't getting tapped. You know, whether it's the record store, the vinyl store, whether it's the drunk person leaving a bar, throwing a Brit, like they are trying to assess how to proceed inside the city limits. And so I think you're exactly right. We're going to see a lot more gyms start popping up and then, the bracket's not going to do it, but I think, you know, national or local media can definitely help showcase that maybe you do have to get on a public transit. Shout out to the G line um, to get to Arvada. But at the same time, like it's, it's things of that nature. You may have to travel a little bit to get the best of the best. And you're not wrong. Poulet is hands down the best fucking thing to eat in Parker. I mean, CD's wings is good. 
Or no, Golden Flame. Golden Flame. Golden Flame. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and listen, so here's a perfect example. Like, people in Parker, good luck getting a takeout order from the Dancing Noodle, a Thai place in Parker, right? It's these ladies making amazing, fresh, uh, drunken noodles. Nobody in Denver knows about them, but we all know about them down here in Douglas County. And like you put in a takeout order, you're going to be waiting an hour to get it because it's that good. But does anybody know about it? No, it's like tucked into a, a another strip mall with like a you know school and a salon and something like that. You would never think to go there, but they exist. Like, and that's the thing. Like people don't even. Sometimes you don't even have to leave your neighborhood. There are just great gems that are in your neighborhood that you maybe drive by a billion times, and then finally you stop and once you're like. I am an idiot for not stopping in this place the previous five years that I've lived here. Right. And so, yeah, like, I think there's just so many great things here in Denver and and listen, the crime, the homelessness, the stuff like that, that's happening in cities across the country by any means. Like people shouldn't feel bad that like Denver is like a bad place. Trust me. Like there are some rough or cities that are going through some rough times trying to figure these, figure these issues out. So Denver is just no different. No, you're not wrong. You know, I just got back from Portugal where they, you know, 10 years ago kind of championed the uh, the safe consumption or the safe injection sites. But the proof was in the pudding there, but mainly because they're not a capitalistic society and they they value harm reduction over everything else. So the healthcare system plays into it. But, you know, like there's L.A. is facing this issue, especially leading into the Olympics in 2028. I was just listening to Bill Simmons podcast about it. And that's, you know, he even asked, he was like, how do we like, like we can't have this city on a deteriorating rate as we currently have and then expect to be showcasing it to the world and be like, oh, come here for the Olympics while we let all these folks either live on the sides. So like when we become, a when we go from a meat and potatoes town to a legitimate city, these are some things that you start to have to face. And, you know, like whether it's, you know, harm reduction for drug users or it's safe injection sites, obviously you'll see a lot of uh, discourse in the capital, but at the same time, it's, it's causing a little bit of a headache for those that are just trying to operate businesses downtown. So I feel for them, and I'm not saying escape downtown. We see a lot of businesses still thriving down there. But the last subject I have for you, Jamie, we'll shift gears. It's the same thing everybody wants to talk about. The same reason my DMs are full at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. It's the restaurants that didn't make the cut. Who, who were omitted based off your watch that deserved a, a fighter's chance, a puncher's chance. I mean, the best Indian restaurant in Denver. I mean, I not, that Denver, not Denver. You know it, right? Urban Village. Come on, man. It's like, fucking good. It is. It's it amazing. Is very good. How is the best Indian restaurant in Denver not in this bracket? Or the Denver metro area, excuse me, because it is technically a Lone Tree. It is Park Meadows Mall. Uh, uh, whatever. Like, that's just. It is. It you is. know what? That's right. fine. No, no, that's fine. Like, if people don't want, listen, my family, we go there enough, we will keep that place open. No problem. Right. So, that's not going to be there. You know, I listen, I like places like the Plymouth. That place never gets mentioned. I love the Plymouth. Again, it's been there forever, been successful forever. People have just turned away from it because they're going to something new. Levin Deli hurts my heart. That the, love that they place. were, they made it to the second, third round, our Sweet 16 last year. Yep. And it, and I eat there every time I stop by Mr. B's. And the fact that they're not on there, especially with as many great bakeries as we have, they are 100% in there. It hurts my heart. And you I know, told Chris, we don't have nearly enough sandwiches, like just sandwich parlors. And, I mean, little Arthur's will have to carry the flag, but a Carmine Lenardo's. That's exactly what I was about to say. Like, right? Like, like fuck. Like, and that's like, on me. Oh, that's on me. I should have just... I should have made the executive decision and mixed somebody and put in a Carmine Leonardo's and Eleven Deli, and I just didn't. And I just, I'm a fucking idiot. Yeah, and it's also a bummer too. Like some restaurants in this bracket, like they don't care to participate, and they're not going to help us out on social media. So you're like, well, why? You know, it's kind of a bummer yeah. to in the bracket because they're not really. They don't care. <laughs> I don't care. The I'm too I'm the I'm too cool crew. I mean, look, I got it. Some of them got their Michelin star. 
They don't want $5,000 for free and they don't want a badass championship belt and a big ass trophy. I get it. But yeah, you're exactly right. Like if we were like, who would be the most fun to party with? I would insert ginger pig yesterday because Natasha Hess is just one of the coolest cucumbers this city has ever seen. And if y'all haven't had it, you know, they got the bib gourmand uh, last autumn. They're just kind of like a neighborhood divey little fun spot. And she's a hoot and a holler. And I think everybody in her neighborhood would rally around her. But at the same time, like we had, I just missed a few and it drives me crazy, especially knowing when some of these folks go down, like with the sinking ship without even fucking trying. Yeah. Bobby. <laughs> <laughs> Bobby, listen, you're in the game. Anybody, listen. I will say, anybody that comes into Denver, I'm like, they're like, where should I go eat? I'm like, you got to go to Tabernetta. Like, that's just the place you got to go. But you know, listen. In the, in the grand scheme of things, people need to realize this is about fun. We're having fun. This isn't a a pure like. These are the best restaurants in yeah, this is, for sure. in Stonehenge. Like we have etched it in stone. Like it's a popularity contest for them. For example, right. Get Rights is boat racing restaurant Olivia in the first round, right? They boat raced them. Nobody in their right mind thinks Get Rights is anywhere close to as good as restaurant Olivia. I'm just saying that right now. Like restaurant Olivia is far and away better than, than Get Rights, the bakery. Okay. But they're going to beat them two to one, probably, you know, in the in the polling, in the voting. And so it is a bit of a, a popular uh, contest. For sure. The key the bakeries. The key, the key is. Which restaurants are amazing and can utilize their uh, their Instagram? Because they will pull like the non followers that you may get like a you know a restaurant A restaurant B, and the average person is like, well, I've eaten at restaurant A. That is amazing. I'm voting for them whether or not I follow B or not. Like you want to get the people that have enjoy your restaurant and your followers, and that is the key to winning this thing. So Penelope is a freight train on Instagram and she does amazing food. That's why she won last year. Hop Alley is going to be another great example of a restaurant that's going to go far. They're doing great things. People love them. They have a good following. They engage on Instagram. I think those are the really the restaurants that you have to watch out for that, that can really utilize both areas, both social media and the excellence of their food. Um, and again, I go, I go back to, that's why I think someone like easy vegan should be, going very far in this tournament. No, I agree wholeheartedly, not only on that rationale, because you're right. It doesn't necessarily square up. And that's half of the DMs. Like, how the fuck am I supposed to pick between sushi and croissants? And I'm using my, you know, Southern accent because I just assume everyone's redneck like myself. But that's ex- that's the fun of it. Like, oh, I'm sorry that Virginia, you know, Purdue doesn't match up with Fairleigh Dickinson, who uh, makes you guard him on the outside and pulls the ED out of the paint. I'm not going to apologize for a 16 up and upsetting a one, but that's exactly what, you know, makes March Madness madness is that, you know, last year we saw folks like Bakery 4. Like they beat Hop Alley in the Final Four, but they ran amok through great restaurants, including, you know, Annette and things of that nature. So anything can happen. This is March. That's the great thing about it. But yeah, Bobby doesn't give a shit about it. <laughs> maybe if like if one of the kitchen members or maybe a front of house person like is like, hey, I was listening to this podcast, Bobby, they were dogging you for not trying. We'll see him like bring some gusto. But I, I don't think that Sunday Vinyl or Tavernetta has ever tried too hard, but they are hands down some of the best dining experiences you can get in Denver. So we may very well crown Uneasy Vegan as our best restaurant, and I would never be prouder. That would make me so fucking happy. I want that, you know, like Yukon was a four seed. Give me a George Mason, you know, that that late – Burst, you know, it kind of reminds you you're a college baseball graduate. That Fresno State four seed, when you get hot, you know, like if you can utilize that social audience, it's awesome. Like, fuck yeah, do it. Have your croissant go beat a fucking steak 
and like a lobster tagliatelle. Unfortunately, Bobby's going to be too worried. He's looking for, uh, he's dusting off that space for the second star for Frosca. So I don't think he's going to engage. But hey, man, you never know. <laughs> I, I have no doubt that he is uh, preparing for that one. And I wouldn't be surprised if Bracket representative Tavernetta dons one this summer as well. Nonetheless, uh, I appreciate you coming in to dive into the brackets. Before we go, I know you mentioned almost sleepers. You picked a couple of fan favorites like your Sap Suez and your Pouettes. You didn't give a champion. If you it's, had to say who's your champion, we have literally 5,000 more people vote and then listen to the podcast. Like that's direct numbers. Who do you have winning it? You won't sway it. If it's up to what I think will engage most people and the best food and it's the newness of it, I'm going to Sapsua. That's a justified restaurant, too. It's not like, oh, they just preyed on social media. No. They knocked the bottom out of that. Yeah, they're up for a James Beard right now. and They're a semifinalist. Like, they're legit. They're bringing the strong food. It's a cool little scene. It's a cool vibe. But, you know, that's all, that's all bullshit if you don't make great food. Plain and simple, right? And they're making excellent yeah. food. People nationally know it. People locally know it. If you haven't been, you need to go. Man, they make an amazing beef rib. Chef, yeah. me, and Anna, they're, they're killing it. Like, you're exactly right. If y'all haven't tried Sapsua, if you haven't tried Barbosa's barbecue, Alejandro, Baton Rouge native, he's got that southern twang with uh, all that Texas flair and fire. Easy Vegan, you've definitely heard the name. They not only tear apart every farmer's market across the community, but they've got a lot of new cool stuff coming down the pike with their vegan hot dogs and all their fucking fun parties. And then obviously Poulet. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if they hoist that thing. If I have to deliver it to them at 7 a.m., I'll be pissed as shit. But it'll <laughs> you'll be, be just a fun. And you'll be the 40th person in line. Waiting yeah. To get <laughs> <laughs> so for those that are wondering, they're open Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. No, they not open Sunday. at eight. No, not Sunday. Not Sunday. Not Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. They open at a realistically, if you're driving down from Denver, try to get there by 7.15, 7.30. Can't tell you how hard I want you to tee off. I mean, the the new breakfast, I guess we'll call them breakfast sammies are great, but macarons and everything. I mean, Sapsua. Who let you mentioned Juan, Jan Wanton being a machine? Since we mentioned uh, Russia a little bit and the Eastern Bloc, then you got to go to Molotov. I mean, there, there's a unique, that's a one of one place in Denver right now, right? Like nobody else is really serving it, that high quality, that kind of cuisine. So, fun fact, and I would be remiss before we leave March 19th, they are hosting what they're calling a butter off. It's going to be a chop style competition between Chef Bo's Molotov chef team and Chef Rico and, you know, Chef Misfits restaurant, which are the same entity. Chef Bo created that. He's doing a chop style competition between his two restaurants. So while they duke it out in our bracket, uh, Molotov still standing and they will both be fighting next Tuesday if y'all want to go to the Butter Bowl. Molotov versus Misfit Kitchen. Yeah, I, I nailed that ad read. I did it off the top of my head. I'm pretty sure. You had me a butter, man. You had me a butter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, hey, Jeremy, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you recording this episode twice. I hope you have a wonderful evening. Safe travels um, to the wine country of, color of America. Uh, I'm very envious, but I hope you travel safe and have fun. Enjoy that snow shovel and all that cement snow you're you're about to run out there and uh, have to deal with. <laughs> my neighbor's going to do everybody's sidewalks, but except mine. yours. <laughs> Dude, I don't know what I did. I don't know. Literally, it's just because I'm able bodied and I put one Biden sign out in my yard. <laughs> Next thing you know, this guy's not shoveling my snow. But either way, I hope you have fun in the nice, tepid, 65-degree weather. Good talking to you, kids. Until next week, y'all stay high, stay hungry.